There we go. There we go. It unmuted itself. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And before I get underway with my traditional intro, I've just got to say, when we do that countdown, we always encourage classes to dance. There was a student in Miss McKay's class that was the single most insane dancer I've ever seen in like seven years of this. So way to go to that class and to everyone who joined in at the beginning there. It's a great start to the program. Uh, my name is Jesse. I'm here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And I know we've got a lot of familiar faces in the crowd today, so welcome back. But if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Everything we do goes live to YouTube and stays there forever. So if you want to show this program to your family, your friends, anyone, strangers in the street after this is done and just show how excited you are about animals, you can just head to that YouTube channel and do just that. And I'm particularly excited today because we get to go hang out with my favorite group in the world to partner with, and that is the Toronto Zoo. I grew up in Toronto. I went to the Toronto Zoo all the time. I spent like hours and hours and days just exploring, looking at the animals, enjoying absolutely all the incredible creatures that they have there. And today's program is particularly special because we've done like 30 broadcasts with the Toronto Zoo, and they've been amazing. We've been to all the pavilions. We've seen all the species. It's been great. But what always happens when we do zoo programs is that we get way more questions than we can possibly answer in a single broadcast. So today, we wanted to make this about you. So we're going to hang out with the Bactrian and Camels. we got a really cool animal today. There's a new baby there as well we might get the chance to see. But mainly, this is have you ever wondered. If there's anything you want to know about animals, about the Toronto Zoo, about zoos in general, you can ask Mary Ellen, Morgan, and Nana. They are going to blow your minds today. I'll try and help in if I can too. And I'm so excited to get underway with all your interest in animals. I'm a biologist, so animals are the best. And I hope you feel the exact same way by the end of the program. I'm going to turn it over to our amazing zoo friends. Welcome in, Mary Ellen Morgan. Nice to Hello. see you again. Hello. Oh, my goodness. Good to be back. Very good to be back. And as you can see, we've already got a few friends standing behind us here. Uh, so we are going to very excitedly lead us through, as Jesse mentioned, a program all about the zoo. If you've ever wanted to know anything about the zoo, if you've missed having a question answered before, we want to hear them. So start spamming the chats if you have to. Jesse, you'll get to sift through all those. We've got some fun bio facts, maybe even some riddles we're going to answer and ask as well. Uh, and we're going to meet our newest zoo resident here as well. But before we get started, I'm going to have Jesse just bring up our land acknowledgement really quickly here for us. Uh, and we are going to read that before we get underway. So we would just like to oh, <laughs> hold on. We got to go back and forth there. We've got a, a little glitch here. Oh, it should be coming up for us in a second. Jesse, we got some technical issues. Yeah, it's coming. It really wants to come. I was just thinking about it. It's very unsure of itself today, but there we go. All good. Something, as Jesse mentioned, something always goes a little haywire with our videos, and that's okay. It makes them more interesting. Uh, so without further ado, we would like to acknowledge that the land that we are on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also like to acknowledge that uh, Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty, signed with multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. Thank you for that, Jesse. Now, I know it's really cool to have me on camera. I've done so many of these videos. We've got uh, Morgan and our keeper friend, Nana, here with us today to be answering some of your questions. But I know we're really here for the camels. I'm a little personally biased. They are my favorite animal at the zoo. Uh, so I love them so much. And hopefully by the end of this video, they will be your favorite animal as well. So I'm going to go through our process here just to change our camera around so we can see the stars. And in fact, the true star of the program has decided to come over. Everyone, I would like to introduce you to Carrie. Now, Carrie was born on May 4th, so may the force be with you there. Uh, and she is our newest resident here at the zoo. And this is her very lovely mama coming down to check us out. So uh, Carrie here is only a few uh, weeks old. Oh, and she's going to go in for a nice little snack there to start off our program. How lovely. Uh, this is her mom, Soraya, and she is eight years old. We also have her paddock buddy over here. Let me turn our camera. That is Josie up there. She is also eight years old. And you might hear some fun chirping behind us today. That is actually our male. And his name is Zip. And he is chirping because he's what's called in rut right now. So he's actually very interested in the ladies behind us. And he's, he's trying to make it known that he is here. 
and he is telling them, hey, ladies, I'm here. I'm, I'm ready for you when you are. So we might hear some interesting sounds coming from uh, coming from Zip today. But we will kick things off since we've got such a great view of our camels right here. Um, we'll just kind of see how they're doing and we'll put it out there. Jesse, do we have questions pouring in or, or do we need uh, a little bit of time to let them come in? Well, we'll wait for our YouTube classes, which are more than welcome to share in the chat. Our live classes, I can head to to see if we have some questions. But I'll start by saying that our absolute dream was to have exactly what just happened happen. We've had such luck with the Toronto Zoo lately, but to have a baby walk up to the camera and feed like live up right five feet from the camera is just insane. Like just unbelievable. These sort of things happen in our broadcast. Miss McKay's class, they actually have a student right at the camera. So if you want to ask about our camels, anything in the zoo, anything in the zoo, here we go. Bye. Here we go. Bye. Nice uh, how long were you up? Uh, how long were you working at the uh, Toronto Zoo? Oh, could you repeat that for us, Ms. McKay? Yeah, how long have you been working at the Toronto Zoo? Ooh. Oh, great oh, question. Great. I love that. So, personally, I've been here for eight years. Um, and I work in our learning and engagement department here at the Toronto Zoo. So if you've ever come to zoo camp before or you've ever stayed overnight at bush camp, I actually might have been your counselor at one point, which is really cool. And I'll let Morgan and Nana chime in as well, because actually the three of us work in different areas and have very different starts here at the zoo. Yeah, so this is Morgan talking. I've been here for only a year and a half, so not nearly as long as Mary Ellen and I work in the wildlife science department so with uh that kind of covers all of our keepers our wildlife health and our conservation science folks and then we'll let Nana come in here as well hello mm -hmm. um so as Nana uh, this is my 10th year so I started out in learning and engagement as a zoo camp counselor and kind of worked a couple different positions and landed in wildlife care in 2020 and have been here since Fantastic. Thanks, ladies. Um, we're going to head to Ms. Becker, Ms. Drum, and Ms. Barajas in a second. We've got Mr. Bits' class. They're joining us in Rochester, Minnesota. Unfortunately, their, their mic isn't working, but they've been sharing some great questions in the chat. So, folks, uh, what is the purpose of the humps of the camel, and how tall is the biggest camel at the zoo? Okay. Oh, good question. So there's a little bit of a trick with their humps, and this is actually a question we ask uh, people when they come into the zoo is, what do we think are in their humps? Now, I'm guessing if anyone's writing in the in the chat, there might be food and water is probably the answer coming through. And while that is correct in a sense, it is a little bit more than that. So it's actually just fat in their humps and they do store it uh, for the sense of uh, hoarding food to make sure that they're able to survive in a harsh environment. Now, you might notice that our friend here, uh, this is Josie in front of us, has a little bit of a floppy hump. Uh, and for some camels in the wild, that might mean that they are using up their fat reserve. But for our camels here, it's actually a genetic marker. So uh, it can be something that's passed on from their mom or their dad. So Josie's dad also had a flat, uh, floppy hump. So Josie has a floppy hump and so does her brother as well. Very, very cool. And then how tall is the biggest one that you have there? Oh, the tallest one here. So that would be our male zip behind us. He's definitely our biggest here. And I'd say mm, from the top of his hump, I'm about, he's got a very fuzzy mouth or fluffy mouth here because of his rutting. From the top of his hump, I'd say he's probably a good nine feet. So I'm six feet tall as a human, uh, which is already pretty tall for people. So he's probably me with maybe like a grade four student standing on my shoulders. <laughs> the strangest and most interesting analogy I've heard all day. Thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, we're going to head to San Diego, Miss Becker's class. If you guys have a question, unmute your mic and come on in. Hey. How much does a camel weigh when it's born? Ooh. Oh, how much does a camel weigh when it's born? Let's see if we can get a little close up uh, where our Carrie went. Oh, she's just around the corner here. There she is. So she is now um, a couple days or a couple weeks old. They haven't gotten an exact weight on her yet. Uh, because she's just so young, they haven't uh, wanted to separate her yet from mom. And they want to just make sure that she's doing all right with her. But I'd say on average, they're about 100 pounds when they're born. So to give you context, a human baby, we're about eight pounds when we're born. So having a camel baby is like having nine or ten uh, human babies all at once. 
Or it's like having a grade four student to continue to use our metaphor going along here. It's perfect. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's head to Ms. Drum's class, Virginia Beach. I want to say we've had like a gazillion classes from Virginia Beach join us this week. So it's so nice to have you guys coming back. Uh, come on in if you have a question. Hey. Why is the baby cam white? Ooh, that's a good one. So yeah, you might notice that uh, mom and Josie here are like a much darker brown color. Now we are in the shade currently, so they look even darker. Um, and yeah, Carrie is like really white in color. So this comes, same thing as the floppy hump that we talked about. It's a genetic marker. So that means it came from mom or dad. Her dad is Zip. And Zip, you might notice he's also very light in color. So that's just a genetic trait of his. He is just a light colored boy and he passed that along to his daughter. That's one other thing, oh, sorry. One Go thing ahead, to add to that is yeah. animals will often kind of change their shade of color as they get older. So an example I have, I'm a horse girl. So horses can be born kind of one color and as they age, their fur goes through transitions as they, sh as they shed their fur and get their winter fur in and all that. So she might get a little bit darker as she gets older too. Fascinating. I, I love that the male is literally frothing at the mouth. That is such a unique part of this broadcast. So thank you for that. Um, oh, lion in the shade there. Nice little cool spot. Um, we're going to head to Miss Barraza's class in the lovely, the uh, truly lovely name, Laguna Vista School. If you want to unmute your mic, Miss Barraza and Oxcard, you're in for questions. Hey. Okay, Charlotte, go ahead. Charlotte? What's your question? Um, what's your favorite camel? Favorite camel, Mary Ellen. <laughs> oh, that's really hard. There, wow. There's so many in front of us right now. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we'll try. Maybe later on in the program, we'll go and meet my app. Sorry, everyone here. My favorite camel. Her name is Tilly. And I love her very much. You might recognize her. I think we featured her in a video maybe before. But she's very recognizable. Tilly has her tongue sticking out of her mouth. And that's from an injury when she was just a baby herself. And then she got surgery to fix it. But because of it, her tongue sticks out. And I think she is just super duper cool. So maybe later in the program, we'll go and try and see Tilly. But let's ask Nana and Morgan. Maybe they also have a favorite. <laughs> Favorites are hard. <laughs> you can't talk to them in front of other camels. I think my favorite, putting aside the baby being super duper cute, is between Jamarcus and Soraya. I don't mm. know which one I'd say like more, but they're both very lovable. There we go. My favorite is Soraya because my very first work week here at the Toronto Zoo, I got to watch Soraya be ultrasounded. So that was really, really cool. And that was kind of my very first experience with the camel. So Soraya's ultrasound was a really cool experience for me. And that's why she was my favorite. Morgan, I think you've set me up beautifully with that segue. And perhaps, <laughs> perhaps there was a hint there, a hint to share this amazing video of a camel ultrasound, which again gets to highlight some of the amazing work that goes behind the scenes at the zoo to care for these animals, to understand them a little better. Uh, zoos are not just places that keep animals, they're places that really do value the survival of these species in the long term. So much work is done for conservation and more. So we're gonna play this yes. clip for a minute, 37 seconds of our camel ultrasound together. So you can check this so, out with me. <laughs> so that's Soraya, that's just a photo. The next photo coming up is our vet ultrasounding. So you have to go through, uh, there's their thick bellies, so you can't do it as a belly, you have to do it through um, internally and then there's our ultrasound video here so look closely at that bump that's along the bottom of the black space uh, i think this video plays again so you can watch it here again there's that little white shading in the big black hole there that is our baby carrie so that was discovered almost a year and a half ago during my first week here and I got to follow the vet out. We did that ultrasound. So the vets had suspicion after some successful breeding attempts that Soraya was pregnant. So we went out, we did the ultrasound and we're very excited to see that little white shading at the bottom of the black hole. Nice. And it's crazy to think that all this time later, wherever she is, there she is, she we is. have a baby. 
<laughs> very cool. What an awesome first week that is. Uh, and thank you for the segue. I appreciate that. Um, live classes, YouTube classes, keep those questions coming. I'm coming back to all our live classes in a row in a minute. Um, one question we got from one of our classes just via email was how many kinds of animals you have at the zoo generally? Our number of total animals, number of species, anything you can share on that would be great. Okay, awesome. So this number has been changing over the past little while. So we currently have around 345 species here at the zoo. That includes all of our species. So fish, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, totaling around 345 species. I believe the total number is around 3,000 to 4,000. Again, it's changing a little bit recently as we uh, go through some changes here at the zoo. Now, a large part of that is because we have big schools of fish. So you might walk around and think, how does this total almost 4,000? But we count every individual fish or amphibian that we have here. So they can end up uh, totally not big, big number. As you should. Um <laughs> Now, we've got a question from Mr. Bits' class. Again, Rochester, thank you for all these great queries in the chat. I'm sorry the tech isn't really cooperating today, but what is the most exotic animal at the zoo? The most, like, maybe the rarest or the furthest away or anything you can want to share on exotic animals? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, exotic, I, we can kind of look at it, I, I guess, in a few different ways in terms of, like, exotic as, yeah, maybe the furthest point away from where we are. Maybe animals that are uh, not as seen as much in zoos, um, especially here in North America. Or there's also who's the most elusive to see. So personally, I think I've mentioned this before, wow. but there is only one animal in the zoo that I have never seen. And Jessie has heard this story a few times. And her name is Annie, and she's an echidna in the Australasia Pavilion. I've been here, like I said, eight years. Never once have I seen Annie in person, only photos of her. But that's because she doesn't come out at the same time of day that I'm here. She's called crepuscular, which means she's awake first thing in the morning and then again in the evening. But she sleeps throughout the daytime because it's really hot where she's from. So that would be like the most elusive animal. I'd say one that's not seen maybe as often here is we have had giant pandas here at the Toronto Zoo, uh, but they were just on loan to us for five years. They went to Calgary for a few years and then they went back home uh, to their zoo in China as well. Yeah. Trying to think off the top of my head here, Nana or Morgan, do you have the most exotic one that we can think of? That is a very, very tough one. I would almost think some of our spiders would be yes. very, very... Now, I'm not as good as naming those off at the top of my head, but we often forget about some of our super cool um, inverts, inverts and, yeah. and stuff. And I think those are all really interesting and not ones that you would see very often. I think in a zoo setting, one of the kind of rare animals is we have a white-headed vulture named Lloyd in the African savannah. He's one of only two in North American zoos, so that Toronto Zoo is one of the only places you can actually see one in person on this continent, which is pretty unique, I'd say. Cool. Nana, you're hired to be in these broadcasts. Right now. <laughs> that is very good. Um, by the way, I will note, I'm so glad you mentioned the panda. So pandas are one of two kinds of creatures that I know that are sort of used as like a diplomatic animal, which is really cool. So Chinese zoos lend out pandas all around the world. We've seen them in the Calgary Zoo, Toronto Zoo, and more. Um, and then I just learned this the other day, kiwis from New Zealand are a similar situation where like eggs will be sent to places and uh, it's sort of like a icon in New Zealand, which is very, very cool. Um, we're going to head back to our live classes. Ms. McKay's class, we're going to do a whole other couple of rounds. So just keep those questions coming. Ms. McKay, two, three. Come on in. Come on in. Um. Hmm. Hmm. Gwendolyn, what's your question? Yes. Uh. Uh. Do you? Uh. Do you have any lizards at the zoo? Any lizards? Any lizards? Lizards, I think we are looking for. Yes, yes we have lots and lots of lizards here at the Toronto Zoo. In fact, one of our lizards we have, his name is um, uh, Keylat, and he is a Komodo dragon, and he's one of the largest ones out there in the world. So he's pretty cool. We've got bearded dragons, um, lots of other reptiles and lizards for sure. We got tons of them. 
Nothing beats the Komodo dragon, though, which is the coolest lizard on the planet. It's the I agree. Lizard. He's pretty it's fierce. Like, it lives in the coolest place. They're just awesome in every way. Anything with lots of teeth. That's my favorite kind of creature. Uh, Miss Becker's class, San Diego, come on back in and uh, unmute your mic. You're good to go. Hey. Um, how yeah. many endangered species do you have? Great question. Good question. So almost, I would say... I would, maybe two thirds or more of our population here at the zoo are endangered uh, on some level. So there is a range to being endangered. You can be near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered. Uh, you can be extinct in the wild and then you can be extinct altogether. So there is a good range to it, but that's the purpose of a zoo is to be a home for animals who aren't doing so well in the wild. So. We really like that our collection of animals showcases the endangerment in the world. And we strive to only have animals that need to be in captivity, not just to have animals in captivity. So we only want to have the endangered ones here and our hope working together, educating the public like we do in these programs is that we won't need to have them in captivity anymore someday. One thing we always like to highlight in zoo programs and something that you can do if you go to zoos and aquariums, whatever city or town that you're in, is look for something called AZA or CAZA accreditation. And what that means if you see that is that that's a place that has animals the highest standards of animal care. They're not a place that's going to let you pet the tiger or have the, you know, wallaby nearby or putting a kitten on your shoulder. It's really important to go to places that are taking care of animals in a meaningful way. These are wild animals. We want to make sure that they have a sort of a decent standard of life. They're not being exploited in any way. So if we're looking to help protect species and recognize the fact that these places help uh, protect endangered species, look for those signs when you go to zoos and aquaria. Um, they'll be very prominently featured on websites, at the place, and more. So I'm really glad we got that question. Miss Drums Class, come on back in in Virginia Beach. If you've got another one for us, you're good to go. Hey. Why do camels have fur if they live in the uh, desert? Yes, great question. Uh, I could talk about these guys all day. I'm glad we circled back to them as they very nicely come over to say hi again. So camels are my favorite animal because they are so incredibly cool. Now, important to note here, these are Bactrian camels. There's also one called dromedary. And we know they're Bactrian because they have two humps. And the letter B has two humps. So B for Bactrian and D for dromedary are the one-humped camels. So they look a little bit different. And they also live in different habitats. So dromedary camels come from a, a hotter, drier desert. Whereas Bactrian camels like these ones, they come from the Gobi Desert, which can be really, really cold or really, really hot. So these camels have to survive both. And you might actually see right now, we'll see if we can get a little bit closer here. They are really shaggy looking in the nicest way possible. I know, please don't get offended. Um, but that's because they're actually losing their winter uh, fur right now. And it's all kind of coming off of them in clumps. You can see down here, they're going to itch it off over the next few weeks. And they're going to look like a naked cat for a little bit. Um, it's the best way I can describe it. It actually looks, you can see here on Soraya's, we're going to look at her butt a little bit here, but you know what? We're a science channel, so it's okay. You can already kind of see the difference between her hair on the outside and then no hair on the inside. And she's going to go to the bathroom there. So I'm going to take a quick step back just to make sure we don't have any accidents today. Uh, but so they will really change as it starts to get warmer here. So I love this, and I'm so glad you mentioned the Gobi Desert in particular. Now, Torontonians actually have a fairly good sense of the temperature fluctuations that happen in the Gobi Desert, but it's one of the places on Earth with the biggest range of temperatures. It can be minus 40 at night and in the winter, and it can be plus 45 in the summer. So that's Celsius. So it can go from minus 40 Fahrenheit to 100 plus Fahrenheit in one location, which is really rare on the earth. So you have to be a pretty special animal to survive that. A Bactrian camels are actually one of the most incredible temperature fluctuation sort of withstanders on planet earth. People certainly could not survive that temperature range without the clothing and gear that we have. So I'm really glad we got that. Thanks, man. Ms. Barajas, if you want to unmute your mic again, you're good to go in Oxnard and take us away. Okay, Thomas, are you ready? I mean, Dwayne, are you ready to ask your question? Okay, go ahead, nice and loud. Your favorite lion. 
I think I heard baby lion. Are we able to repeat the question? Do you want to repeat it, Duane, really loud? What's your favorite lion? Favorite lion? And if you want to tell us about your lions, do you have lions at the zoo for people who might not know and, and more? We do. Yeah, so we have white lions here at the zoo, and we have three of them. Their names are Fintan, Lemon, and Macaulay. Fintan is our male, and then Lemon and Macaulay are our two females. And honestly, I love them all, but I think Fintan might take the cake. And that's because he really loves scents. Uh, so we've talked about this in other videos I know about uh, different ways that we enrich animals' lives here at the zoo to make their life more natural for them um, and to give them kind of their natural foraging behavior. So for example, if we look out into the exhibit out here, we can see that we try and keep it natural with the grass and uh, the different kind of like there's huts down there. They're a little bit harder to see. But we also have rocks and things for them to rub up against. In their off exhibit area, you'll see lots of things for them to brush up against to help take their fur off. Other animals might have interesting ways that they're eating their food. These are all types of enrichment that we use. And Fintan loves smelly things. Specifically, he's got a taste for different perfumes and colognes. So his keepers will spray really expensive cologne for him all over his exhibit. And he rubs up against the fences just like your cat at home would. And I think that's just a really cool thing to see. So he might be my favorite. That is very cool. I love that answer. Um, geez, so many questions from Mr. Bits's class. You guys are amazing in the chat. Um, this might be for Nana more than anyone else. Is there a, an injury you've had or a worst injury you've had taking care of animals? And maybe if you could speak to how we try and avoid having injuries when we're dealing with animals that are bigger than us or have big teeth or anything else you might know from a life as uh, animal caregiver? <laughs> Uh, so honestly, the injury I've had relatively recently had, was in an animal enclosure, but it had nothing to do with the animal. And I think that's what happens to most keepers. Typically, your, your injuries aren't going to be like bites or scratches because we, do, we, are, we work very carefully with our animals. We learn to read their behavior. We give them space if they're feeling a little off or they just don't want, to, don't want us near to buy. Um, so my injury actually happened in the bison paddock in the Canadian domain. Um, and I'm not sure if any of you have visited the Toronto Zoo before. Uh, when the Canadian Domain team works with the bison, they drive their truck in, and it's a big truck with a flatbed on the back. Um, and I was getting up on the back to grab some food for the bison, and my ankle did not like that motion that day, and I hurt my tendon. Um, and I wore like a cast boot for a solid month. So had nothing to the animal. The animals didn't do anything. They were just watching me as I was grabbing food for them. And I didn't do anything crazy, just hurt myself and then tossed them food and went on and went to see the nurse. So I healed. But I think that's what typically happens. You're like the crazy injuries keepers get usually have nothing to do with the animals. <laughs> I'm really glad you mentioned this. I'm glad you're, you're mended too and better, but I've actually never heard of an animal getting someone in any fashion at a zoo or aquarium uh it's always been like slipped on some water or like trip getting into the truck or picked up too heavy a bag so that's a pretty good sign and again you spoke to this at the beginning but zoos and aquaria do an amazing job of not putting themselves in positions where they're likely to have any harm with an animal so you're not walking into the wolf enclosure by yourself you're uh, there's a lot of care taken especially with bigger animals with predators uh to make sure that nothing like that ever happens so nana we're glad you're you're better and uh thank you very much for that question mr pitts youtubers feel free to chime in as well i'm gonna go uh to uh, miss mckay's class again we're gonna do another round of questions this has been so much fun everybody so chalk river come on in come on in The rarest camel? The rarest camel? Yeah. And if you can speak, so the Bactrian camel, we can speak to, do you know how many there are in the world, Mary Ellen and team? I do. So there's a little bit of a difference here. And while I answer this question, just because our friends have gone a little bit further on, we're going to go see if we can find uh, Tilly, who's my favorite camel. So we're going to go on a little walk together here uh, through our space. So come with us as we answer this question. So there's a slight difference in the camels. Uh, for a domesticated versus a wild camel. So we have domesticated camels here at the Toronto Zoo, but actually wild camels right now are very critically endangered. So that means that there are not many of them left. And I think if I had to guess, there's a couple thousand of them left right now. 
less than a thousand. There we go. Nana coming through with our, wow. our markers here. So they're not doing super well. We do have uh, domesticated Bactrian camels, though. We do not have wild camels here. Yeah. Uh, and this is really important. So we talked about Bactrian and dromedary. So Bactrian are the wild ones that we find in the Gobi Desert. They're one of the rarest big mammals in the world, comparable to something like a panda bear. Uh, so really, really critically endangered. Fortunately for them, they're in a place that's really difficult for people to get to. So some of the threats that they would otherwise face aren't as big an issue as something like a Siberian tiger. Uh, dromedary camels, so a, a sort of domesticated or feral camels that have sort of gotten into the wild in Egypt and Australia in a big way. There are several hundred thousand dromedary camels that are out in the wild, uh, many of which in places that they're not actually like originally from. Um, and so I'm, I'm really glad we got that question. Thanks, Mr. K. This is, by the way, can I just say again, that is there a better job on earth than getting to like walk around and talk about animals and feed big shaggy tongue camels? I don't know. I don't think I, so. I, I haven't found one yet if there is. No, this is pretty great. There's the tongue you were talking about. <laughs> it is, yes. So this is Tilly on the left here. This one's Tilly. You can see her nice long tongue hanging out. And people always get worried in the winter if it's going to dry out or get cold. She can bring it in her mouth if she wants to. Um, she just chooses like not to. It's more comfortable to have it out. Uh, it does not affect her at all, though. Tilly is our oldest camel we have here. And she eats fine. The keepers make sure she's good. She's got Nana on her side. Uh, so she's all good. And then this little guy over here, this is Jamarcus. Nice. Well, by the way, Tilly's my favorite, I've determined, because um, as my wife pointed out the other day, when I focus on something really in depth, I stick my tongue out as well. They're like that. So I haven't done any of the broadcasts for you kids, thankfully. Uh, but Tilly's my my new friend. Um, and right up to the camera. <laughs> Thanks, Tilly. Um, Ms. Becker's class, San Diego, we're going to head to you guys. Come on in. <laughs> How old can camels get? Yeah, how old can camels get? Yeah, so there's a range. I know that we always talk about this when we are in videos here as well, uh, is that there's a difference for some animals on their lifespan in wild settings versus captive settings. So camels can be into their 50s or so, uh, which is a pretty good lifespan for them. It's about half the average of a human lifespan, which is pretty impressive. Uh, but that can be dependent. So in the wild, it can be a little bit more dangerous for them. A baby camel is excellent food for other predators around them. So they do have to be very careful with their babies, getting them up and moving right away uh, so that they don't get injured by another creature out there. Not every animal does better in captivity, but a lot of them definitely do because we're able to provide them vet care. Uh, we're able to provide them all the food and nutrition that they need and kind of monitor their progress. I'm not sure if anyone follows us on social media, but we've been updating everyone the last couple days. One of our Amor Tigers, Maisie, has actually been not feeling so great. Uh, and she went to go visit our vets in the health unit. And we've been posting some updates on her health and how she's doing. She's on the mend right now, which is really great. Um, and so we are able to provide that care with them here, which is really cool. Amazing. And this is something that the Toronto Zoo does better than almost any zoo in the world. If you want to follow up with animals, individual uh, creatures that you sort of come to know and love over many years, you can do that really, really well through the Toronto Zoo's website, their social media and more. Um, it's a really special opportunity to connect with some really special creatures. Um, team, I completely forgot to do a shout out for this class, Mr. Prentice's class in the same school as Ms. Drum's class, right down the hall. So they, they're in, they were watching. A big shout out to you guys in Virginia Beach as well. And one of the students in the class uh, wanted to know if you have any Asian water monitors, very different from our camels now. <laughs> Ooh, Asian water monitors. Ooh, hold on. We're going to walk through the zoo mentally. Once you've been here long enough, you can uh, tour the whole zoo in your brain. I'm going to do that really quickly here. Um, Asian water, water monitors. I don't think we have any that I can think of. Um, maybe we should though. I feel like we need to do some research on them. The Komodo dragon is in Asia. It is a monitor and it lives near and around, but not exactly what you're looking for. Do you, <laughs> any, do you have any lace monitors? They're Australian, I think. Uh, no lace monitors that I can think of either. Mm. We maybe we got to talk to our team though. Those sound like some some interesting animals. If they need help in the wild, maybe we could uh, we could make a suggestion. So, Mr. Prentice's class super lizard program that will come up in the future just for this question. Way to go! <laughs> uh, but modern, by the way, as a huge reptile lover, water monitors are one of the most amazing groups of animals in the world. So, I'm so glad we have a student keen on them. Uh, Miss Drums class, let's head to you guys and uh, come on in. Hey. 
Um, what's the oldest animal at the zoo? Oh. Ah, I think we've had this question in previous ones, and there's a little bit of a debate with that. And that's because we have a couple animals we're not exactly sure of their exact birth year. So we have two Aldabra tortoises who can live for up to 200 years. And we think they're somewhere in their 50s to 70s. We're not exactly sure of their age, uh, but we know that they are older and it's really hard to date a tortoise because they grow so slowly. And then we also have an orangutan who is up in her 40s, 46 or so. And we also have Charles, one of our lowland gorillas, who just recently turned 49, I believe. So we have a couple uh, older animals out there, um, but I, I think Honestly, my bet is on our tortoises being the oldest. Uh, I'm going to follow up on this just because of the species you chose to say, as someone who's been to the Toronto Zoo a whole bunch, for any of our students who ever get the chance, the lowland gorillas and the orangutans are the most incredible animals to watch in person ever. You can easily spend an hour watching the behavior. It is fascinating. Most of my favorite memories with the zoo are with one of the two of them. And the Aldabra tortoises, I'm so glad you mentioned this. Look this up when you're done. They're a really weird species. Aldabra is an island that you need actual special permission to go to from the government of Aldabra in the area. Um, it's a really incredible nature preserve. And it's so barren that the tortoises there actually eat meat occasionally. So if something's dead, they will come and just rip it apart, which is really unique and weird for tortoises. Because when there's so little food, you'll eat whatever nature gives you. Um, Ms. Barajas of class, we're going to head to you guys. And then... I know we can go all day with questions. We will wrap it up not long after that, but I do want to encourage all our classes, torontozoo.com, all their social media pages, so much more to learn and discover. And it's just been the greatest camel program ever. We didn't intend for this to just be pure camels, but we got so many great camel questions and we've never had animals this close to the camera for this long. So way to go, everybody. Right. Um, and Tilly's laid down with us here. So she is just, she's vibing with us. Yeah. I mean, she took my new friendship thing, I think, really seriously. And I really appreciate that. <laughs> Um, Miss Barajas, Oxnard, come on in again and take us away. Okay, Brianna. Um, when was the zoo founded? So the zoo will be celebrating its 49th year or birthday uh, this August 16th, coming up in the summer. Uh, so let me just do some quick math. I believe that takes us to 1974 as our first an inaugural year, we'll say. Um, we are used to be called the Toronto Metro Zoo as well. So there's a bit of a history there with our name kind of changing partway through. So we'll be 49 years old this year. And I'm going to take this opportunity to plug. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary next year. So there is going to be so many fun events at the zoo, a ton of communications that we're going to be putting out, showcasing our 50 years of science and conservation history. So it'll be a big year at the zoo next year. And you'll find out all of that again on those social media pages, their website, and so much more. I can't believe the zoo is that young that when I went was a, was a little kid, it was only like 20 something years old. That's really weird for me. Um, so, unexpected question. Thank you for that, Ms. Barraza's class. Students, thank you all so much for your enthusiasm for animals, for wildlife, for camels today. We've had a really great time getting to hang out with this really special creature. Um, so thank you all more than you know. If you have additional questions, email them to us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We will pass them on to the zoo team. Anything you want to know about animals, we will keep the learning going when we are done. And I can pass along a bunch of resources to do just that when we're done with this broadcast. Mary Ellen, Morgan, Nana, thank you all so much uh, for everything. And as you know, what we do to wrap up every broadcast, and for our camel's sake, I'm going to bring in all our classes to say a big thank you and farewell. So, Ms. Barajas, Ms. Drum, Ms. Becker, Ms. McKay's class, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.